So let me welcome uh, to the stage the panellists. I'm going to actually ask them also to say at the start a little bit about their perspective and where they're coming from, so I'm not going to do long introductions. But uh, Claudio Facin, president of uh, ABB Power Grids. Lex Greensill, co-founder and CEO of Greensill. Youssef Algeda, CEO and board member of the Qatar Financial Center. And Dev Sanyal, uh, chief exec of uh, the Alternative Energy uh, and Executive Vice President of Regions for BP. So thanks very much to our speakers. <laughs> so uh, it struck me as I was on my way here, you know, it's been 50 years uh, of the WEF. Maybe no one in this room has actually been to 50, although sometimes it feels like that. Um, but I, of all the things, we're always talking about disruption and the world being turned on its head and nothing stays the same. I bet we could have had a spotlight on FDI session 50 years ago. I mean, it is one of the sort of fixed points of the global firmament when you talk about, especially talking to a country, my experience as a development economist, uh, when you are uh, talking about the recipe for economic success, that has always involved a conversation about foreign direct investment and how you attract it. But I can't help thinking that uh, the environment has changed quite a lot in that time, even if some of the sort of formal language we're using around FDI is the same. So I'm interested in how, in how all of you see that and whether you think the environment has changed. But, but Claudio, maybe just starting with you, could you say a little bit about um, where you sit in this world and uh, briefly how you think the, the, environment, the environment has changed um, or not changed? Uh, for FDI. So, uh, first of all, starting, it's, um, I'm, I'm running the energy, the power grids part of uh, ABB. ABB is a technology provider. Uh, we do um, anything from uh, small devices to manage electricity all the way up to uh, uh, motors, uh, charging infrastructure for electrical vehicles. Uh, we electrify uh, uh, transportation and obviously um, help uh, industry to digitalize, to uh, drive automation productivity. And I'm running the power grids part, which is basically transmission distribution infrastructure, uh, where we see a tremendous uh, transformation. So we're there to uh, support that transformation, mainly from a uh, technology standpoint. And um, what we see is that that transformation in, in, in this space, it's been uh, changing from uh, sort of a regional approach uh, last uh, 15, 20 years uh, into a really a, a global trend. There is no doubt that um, you know, renewal penetration is increasing across uh, every country, every market has a different uh, uh, maybe speed and scale at which uh, deploying that. But we're right uh, there to support making sure that when we integrate renewables, uh, we manage the variability and uh, we uh, uh, confirm, so to say, the reliability. We make sure that we have uh, resilience in that system, that we reduce losses. And uh, maybe just one uh, thought to start with, if you look at in the past, uh, where to invest and how to invest, how to uh, support development of that technology on, on a global scale, um, there was a lot about uh, the uh, sustainable economic side of it. Uh, but in the last 10 years with this transformation, we see more and more the uh, environmental piece playing a, a role, so the sustainability from an from a, uh, ecosystem and the whole social aspects as well. So those are the mm. three um, that have always been there, but the weighting is yeah. probably being changed. No, and I think we should, we should, we'll get into that uh, later. I mean, uh, Lex, we had power grid, uh, power grids and power companies 50 years ago. We didn't necessarily have supply chain finance companies. So maybe say a little bit about your business um, as well as the FDI perspective. Certainly. So Greensill is uh, a, uh, a leading provider of supply chain financing. We last year delivered $150 billion of new credit to 2.5 million companies in, in over 170 countries. We did that using uh, the latest in technology and, and our unrivaled access to, to global capital markets. Uh, and uh, we expect that uh, that, that uh, growth that we've seen is going to, is going to continue in an exponential sense. So in a, in a sense, I guess, we're the financial equivalent of, uh, of, of what uh, Claudio and ABB uh, do. Uh, I, I think the, the interesting thing that uh, uh, for us is we take capital 
largely in developed markets, um, and we deploy those in multiple jurisdictions globally, as I said, kind of uh, over 170 countries. And so for us, it's actually the financial transmission mechanisms and rules that actually govern our ability to deliver ultra cheap capital uh, to, uh, to companies in every corner of the globe. And, and there's a number of interesting kind of, uh, kind of ingredients to that, um, <coughs> but, uh, which I'm sure we'll be talking about today, uh, that, that basically free up and allow capital to move much more freely than <coughs> it's ever done before. I think there's a, yeah, no, there is a lot um, to get into uh, there. Yusuf, I guess you're, on this panel at least, you're the ones, uh, and people might be a little bit surprised to hear it, but of, we have uh, three representatives of the, who are sort of agents of, of FDI, but you're in the business at the moment of, of trying to uh, attract it. Uh, so maybe say a little bit about that. Yeah, definitely, Stephanie. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, li like you put it, we're, we're on the buy side, so my job is to basically attract all these guys and try to house them within the uh, uh, Qatar platform, uh, more specifically Qatar Financial Center platform. But the Qatar Financial Center is a business environment which comprises of the regulatory and the judicial and the strategic uh, infrastructure that enables companies to basically do business in the uh, most efficient way uh, possible uh, in our uh, home country. Uh, so the Qatar Financial Center tracks FDI. It's, it's very important to us to figure out where the flows are going globally and to uh, try to basically uh, put in place the most uh, hospitable environment, business environment, when it comes to attracting, attracting multinational corporations to base themselves uh, in Qatar. As you know, there's a lot of factors that play within FDI. If I ask every gentleman on this panel what would attract you, everybody would give you probably a different answer from a regulatory to uh, a business uh, uh, need to uh, perhaps uh, an incentive need uh, for other. But it's my job to basically figure out what's the best way possible in terms of attracting as much FDI uh, as possible into uh, uh, Qatar, and I have to basically figure out uh, where are the flows going, and apparently, if you look at the past two years, uh, uh, there's, there's been a slowdown in terms of FDI flows. Uh, uh, developed countries are not growing in terms of FDI. Developing countries are growing the most, and uh, surprisingly, a lot of that growth is happening in Asia, and a lot of it is happening uh, in China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Indonesia, uh, India and Turkey. So, uh, you know, for uh, 2020, it's going to be my job to figure out uh, how much of that flow I can capture within the Asian story into uh, the Middle East and more specifically uh, Qatar. So, yes, I'm, I'm on the buy side, and what makes me happy is to see as many of the people here today to establish their companies and offices in Qatar. Uh, well, no, thank you. I think, we're, and we will we'll get back to the, back to that because I think it raises a number of questions. But Dev Dev Sanya, I suspect VP could have been on that panel about FDI 50 years ago, um, but maybe not talking about alternative energy. So uh, maybe say a little bit. So I think uh, BP, of course, is a global company, and in many respects, uh, Stephanie, we are a beneficiary of globalization. And over the last 30 years, when you take a step back, you've seen global GDP basically quadruple, you've seen, um, you know, not just sort of economic prosperity, but well-being. The people living on less than a dollar a day is halved. Uh, you've actually seen uh, life expectancy rise by seven years. You've seen child mortality halve. So, you know, you've actually seen a number of indicators of progress uh, over the course of the last 30 years when globalization kind of began. And companies like BP, companies like ABB, uh, certainly have been beneficiaries of that. I think we are at this sort of inflection point where there are two, I think, very important trends that uh, I think are important to counter against. Number one is the sense that globalization uh, actually has not brought about enough benefits. And you could say that uh, on a macro sense it has, but on a micro sense there are still inequalities that have to be dealt with. I mean, you know, in the United States, for example, uh, the benefits to in the course of the last uh, decade, that the benefits to the bottom 50% is actually vastly 
uh, dissimilar to that. So there's more work to be done in terms of actually making sure that the micro benefits are accruing. And I think there is also another very important dimension uh, as we think about globalization, which is how do we kind of do this in a more sustainable way. So I think for a company like BP, there are four things we sort of look for. Uh, and we've been looking for since we were founded 110 years ago as the annual Persian oil company. In, that, in other words, an early beneficiary of globalization uh, back in the day. Um, I think the first is around conditions. And uh, I'm fond of saying that actually conditions below the ground are very important for us, but conditions above the ground are more compelling. So, you know, the usual uh, data points around the tax regime, the fiscal regime, et cetera, are very important. Uh, and I think this is something that um, is not just a, a sort of theoretical thing, but in our industry, if you look back over the last century, uh, many places have experienced what we call the resource curse, uh, the curse of plenty. So how do you manage that in a way which is actually accruing benefits to everybody is important. The second area is on what I call conduct, uh, broadly uh, corporate governance, making sure that the rule of law applies, making sure that contracts are upheld. Uh, because, of course, when we invest in a country, we don't take a one or two year perspective. We take a multi-decade perspective. As I'm fond of saying, uh, we were there when uh, King Farouk was in charge. We were there in between, and we are still there in Egypt uh, with all the uh, various cycles in Egypt. we are a very large investor there, for example. I think the sort of um, third area is on continuing partnerships. You can see a theme of three, four Cs. Um, and, and partnerships are very important. So in countries we invest in, we are seeking to complement our capabilities with the capabilities of other institutions. And the fourth and final area really is on climate strategies, which I think sort of 50 years ago, um, Stephanie, I doubt we'd talk about it, but I think this has now become increasingly important. How do we um, invest in countries in a way that actually creates well-being in the fullest sense of the word? And of course, you know, there is the issue of how do you grow your renewables business, but it's also about how do you decarbonize hydrocarbons? because I think this is going to be very important. 80% of the world, just to put it in perspective, um, live on less than 100 gigajoules per head. What does that mean? You know, from a HDI perspective, the Human Development Index perspective, that means effectively they are in a less developing state of their economy. Um, that is going to change. And how we do it in a way different from the past, I think is going to be not just an important question, I think in many respects it's an existential question. Mm. Just to follow up on that, and I think we, I mean, we will, I, I want to, I think we'll have a big piece thinking about the sustainability from the environmental perspective, but I'm struck by um, your your four things um, and your mention of avoiding the, the resource curse. I mean, that has been, maybe that is one of the things that we have, the world has kind of developed knowledge on over the last uh, few years. And you know, often it has been it's FDI that helps exacerbate that resource curse because it's the one bit of the, it, the one bit of the country that attracts loads of money, and then that in itself distorts the um, distorts the economy. So, just from your perspective, do you feel like we now have a good? There are good examples of countries that have managed to avoid this and have worked with foreign partners to avoid that curse, or do you think it's a continuing issue? Well, no, I think there's a lot of progress being made, but I think it's also fair to say there's more work to be done. So you look at a country like Trinidad, they've actually developed a fabrication industry. Uh, when you look at Azerbaijan, they actually have now diversified their economy so that they can actually be now an exporter of some of these services in different parts of the world. If you look at the UK, Stephanie, I mean, the North Sea, you know, effectively has now created an industry in the offshore services sector that actually is going to be there for a long, long time to come. Uh, and that will, of course, also evolve because offshore is not just oil and gas. It could be wind in the future. So I think, um, you, you know, when you look at sort of recent experiences in places like um, Trinidad, in places like Azerbaijan, you know, a lot of progress has been made. But I think it's fair to say it continues to be a challenge. It continues to be an area of focus. But more importantly, I think an area of opportunity. I mean, if you can get this right, you truly then create a license for yourself that is um, multi-generational. So just picking up on the um, question of the sort of social sustainability or the political sustainability, because that is, again, you know, one of the things in the relatively in the last few years that has changed is obviously we are talking about populism. We're talking about globalization needing to deliver for more um, people. Uh, Claudio, you mentioned it in your opening remarks. 
I mean, is that something that one now adds to the recipe? You say, you know, as, as Dev did, you look at the conditions, you know, is it a good tax system? Is another question, is this a tax system that's going to last because it has broad political support, or actually is it somewhere that you could see um, the basic rules overturned or at least questioned? You know, the US, you could raise that question. We could face very different taxes in a couple of years. Yeah, that's, uh, <coughs> you know, to go back to uh, what Deb was saying, the, um, the, the importance of uh, obviously the long term, uh, when we take decisions on investment, we don't look at the next uh, year or the next three years. It, it's, you know, decades uh, and, uh, you know, technology uh, needs to come in and support, but we also look at where to invest, uh, not just from a regulatory standpoint or tax uh, environment, Obviously, stability is an essential part uh, for that decision, uh, but is the opportunity to uh, to be there with the right uh, resource pool. So, if there are in that specific country strong um, policies uh, or support for education, for making sure that uh, people can uh, build up uh, competence. That's an area where we obviously, uh, on the long term, uh, as basically for us technology is, yes, is innovation, but it's also about people. We need that as an, as an essential part of the, of the decision-making process. And just to sort of push you a bit, I mean, because the, the, uh, the stereotype of, a, of, an F, of the, the sort of classic example, which you may not be involved in, but where uh, various countries are competing to attract X factory or whatever it might be, which you then might enable uh, to happen. Um, the perception is always it's about the sort of race to the bottom, you know, who can be offered the biggest tax incentives, uh, the lowest tax base. Is it genuinely the case that you think now companies or partners that you're working with are looking past that and saying, actually, we don't want it to be too low if that's not going to be sustainable? Or is that, do we say that, but have you actually seen it in practice? We, we, actually, we actually do that. And we also look for partners that, that walk the same talk, so to say. Uh, uh, as, as we said, first of all, uh, there is no doubt that there is some sort of higher volatility that we've seen certainly on, on the energy space because of the huge transformation we're going through. Um, and again, uh, our investments, they have a 15, 20, 25 plus uh, years horizon. Uh, and for that, uh, yes, there might be some uh, changes on tax regimes and, and so on. And yes, there is a Obviously, we look for incentives to uh, kickstart some of these investments, but uh, the long term is the one that then gets supported by, uh, do we have a strong uh, system that supports education, that supports the people that need to develop that technology, that need to deliver that technology to, uh, to the customers? Lex, I was struck when you were talking, I mean, remittances is something that we probably um, don't talk about enough in this setting. And there is a sense in which the biggest source of FDI globally is remittances. So you have, I guess you're looking at this from two perspectives. You're enabling mm. a kind of individual FDI as well as being a source of it yourself. That's a great, uh, a great point. Uh, I, I think kind of adding to the points that uh, the other panelists have made, uh, the, the things that really drive our ability to, to deliver capital into uh, into all economies, but particularly emerging economies, um, is, is really ties back to convertibility of currency, um, because effectively the less freely convertible it is, the higher effectively the tax on getting capital um, into and indeed out of the, 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 uh, the country. But one that probably not many people think about is actually just the boring thing of the, the central bank kind of rules around payment infrastructure, the speed with which that works, the cost of that. What we've seen is a number of economies bringing that cost down to almost effectively zero. Um, uh, and that is, um, although it sounds terribly boring, that is a continuous tax. Those two things hold back capital. What businesses like ours do is we take capital from those who save generally in, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, um, emerging, uh, emerged, uh, developed economies, and we deliver it to, to those that, uh, that need it. Um, and uh, as Stephanie said, one of the real developing part of our business is we don't just allow kind of uh, people who have invoices to sell them and get their cash. We actually allow employees to get paid every day as opposed to getting paid once a month. Um, completely for free 
and then use our unique rails to then deliver that capital back to their home country um, at no cost. And so I think that is actually helping to further lubricate um, the, uh, the delivery of, uh, of FDI on a, on a global basis. And I think one of our big government customers that we have, kind of over 20% of their employees are remitting capital back to, uh, to emerging uh, countries. And of those 20%, the level that they're remitting runs at, on average, about a third of their total um, mm -hmm. kind of received uh, pay. So it's actually these these small things that I'm talking about that seem terribly kind of minor to, to people who think really big, actually because so much remittance is actually happening at an individual level um, on a daily basis, these things are actually massive in terms of their impact. Mm. And uh, just following up on that, I mean, we have, over the last few years in Davos, we've probably had quite a few conversations about uh, the potential um, you know, differential regulations kind of making this less of a global capital market and a global financial system, you know, relatively in the sort of post-crisis world. I mean, you're sitting there and you're almost at the underbelly. <laughs> you know, you're getting to see under the hood yes. of these national payment systems. Would you say, you know, relative to 10 years ago that it was a more fragmented system or is sort of is the basic plumbing still feels like a global economy? I, I would actually say that what's changed is the visibility that we have real time. So one of the things that possibly people don't know about our company is over 50% of all containerized freight in the world, we finance it. Hmm. So we see that information live every minute of every day. Um, and so actually that visibility, that ability to instantaneously make decisions on the back of that um, is something that has never existed in the, uh, in, the, in the past. And so when you think about delivering capital, what does capital want above all other things? It wants to know the truth. Um, and that information kind of equals truth, which means we can deliver more capital faster and more importantly, mm. cheaper. You know, I can't help mentioning here, those of you who are lucky enough to have a Bloomberg terminal, going with that fascinating subject, or that fact that we just heard, which I wrote down because I thought it was pretty interesting, uh, AHOY, A-H-O-Y, is a particularly excellent function on the Bloomberg terminal, where at any given time you can see all of the ships all over the world, what they're taking where. Um, which particularly for those of us involved in the thinking about the trade wars has been useful. But I would say um, if you want to know, you should get yourself a, a nice Bloomberg subscription if you want to know where all those ships, all those containers are that you're uh, Already that you're there financing. and we use it. <laughs> um, use of, uh, of course, the obvious question to you, uh, I mean, I think all of these things uh, affect uh, the way you're thinking about how you attract. But... Um, you're in the Qatar is clearly in a different situation than many of the countries that are going out there uh, trying to attract FDI because you don't strictly need the money. So just sort of say what it is that you think. Is this about know-how? Is it about connectivity with the global system? What is it you're thinking of getting from the FDI? Or diversification, I'm sure. Well, first of all, we realize that uh, FDI is a, an important factor in terms of our economic diversification plans. Uh, so we've, we've, we've made that decision and we've prioritized it. But if we go back to 1995, and maybe now, yes, Qatar has a surplus of uh, wealth and a, one of the largest uh, sovereign wealth funds in the world, but back in 1995, when we jump-start our liquefied natural gas industry, and we've, back then uh, we've invested a couple of billion dollars, and a lot of it was FDI dollars, uh, uh, into basically LNG trains, uh, with partnerships uh, throughout the world uh, with conglomerates in the oil and gas industry, the likes of ExxonMobil Total, uh, a lot of that was based on FDI money. Uh, uh, so when we made that uh, bet uh, back then, uh, and in 2002 when we've become basically one of the largest uh, liquefied natural gas exporters, I think our need for FDI was a lot less. So there wasn't an urgent need because we had to deal with all this surplus money coming in from uh, selling our liquefied natural gas uh, globally. So our economy kind of uh, uh, did grow at uh, double digit uh, growth rates for a decade. Uh, but fast forward the financial crisis, that's when we had to start to thinking about, uh, okay, we've got the LNG uh, piece right, what else are we gonna do in terms of attracting foreign direct investment? 
because apparently our economy is not going to continue to grow at double-digit growth rates. <coughs> so fast forward 2017, uh, where our economy is uh, growing at a single digit, we need to figure out now uh, what sector are we going to prioritize other than LNG and what infrastructure and what legal environment uh, and regulatory amendments we have to make to basically cater for all, this, uh, all these needs here uh, around the table. So uh, immediately what we've done in 2017 is, uh, first of all, we had to open up the environment. The country uh, wasn't very open in terms of uh, attracting tourists. Uh, you know, the visa process was very difficult, so we had to open that up immediately. We've opened up for more than 80 countries on the spot overnight. Uh, and then we had to figure out how do we go from a uh, uh, protected uh, foreign ownership regime to a 100% foreign ownership regime in certain sectors, of course, without upsetting uh, uh, our local uh, companies and our, our local conglomerates. So, uh, you know, it took us two years to figure that out. Now, basically, pretty much all our sectors are open up for 100% foreign ownership. Uh, we have a legal environment that operates under English common law, which is parallel to the existing environment. And by the way, it's taxed. So we, we, uh, we do realize that, uh, you know, with all the, uh, I think, the tax problems globally when it comes to blacklisting, uh, you know, countries that are uh, not basically uh, taking enough tax and, uh, and are not uh, basically doing much in, in terms of improving their tax environments, which basically has implica implica implications in terms of anti-money laundering. So we, we made sure that our environment is taxed, but is also in accordance with international uh, best practice. So we have our own court system, we have our own legal environment, also based on international best practice, allowing 100% foreign ownership, parallel to the existing environment, and hopefully uh, within a decade that would materialize into enough FDI, which will basically help us uh, grow our economy. But basically we had to go through a lot of amendments in the past two years. Uh, whether it's tax, whether it's the judicial environment, whether it's opening up our sectors, whether it's uh, making basically the registration process a lot simpler uh, from a two-month process to an overnight uh, process. So all, all of that, I think, is the infrastructure required mm -hmm. to uh, eventually go out in the market and attract uh, that FDI. But of course, like you said, we realize there's a fierce competition uh, towards FDI. There's more than 5,000 special economic zones globally that were put there to attract foreign direct investment and help countries basically boost their exports. Uh, and we realize there's many special economic zones in the Asian continent and in the MENA region. Uh, and therefore, we had to think a bit out of the box and incentivize businesses, along with all these uh, uh, amendments that I've just mentioned, to attract companies so that we can uh, basically provide the cheapest cost of doing business in the region and basically one of the most efficient uh, regimes in terms of doing business. So putting all that together, hopefully, we're going to go out in a 10-year plan and start basically attracting foreign direct investment, specific specifically for the MENA region, but also for uh, 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 Southeast Asia uh, and nearby countries that are going through a reconstruction uh, program such as uh, Iraq, a potential future, uh, Syria perhaps, uh, you know, countries like Kuwait and Oman, and these are developing economies that are growing uh, <coughs> massively, but hoping that, you know, the legal environment and all the amendments we've done in the past two years will help us attract uh, more and foreign direct investment. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so to answer your question, a massive overhaul to our entire legal environment with a nice incentive package, which will hopefully attract uh, everybody here around me on the panel. Um, with also a little bit of seeding of, of control in the sense that, you know, you have that, the, the classic trade-off that you actually have to be willing to um, give the full ownership and make those kind of uh, trade-offs. Sorry, Claudio. Yeah, if I may just add, add, come back to that, you know, 5,000 uh, zones. Uh, the, um, I think the, the, the way we look at this, and certainly um, uh, Dev um, uh, can expand on this, first of all, there is a... Uh, from an investment standpoint, uh, a must-have. And so you have to start with uh, the, uh, you know, we call it the value pair, safety and integrity. I would add to that the security aspect, and more and more it's security of uh, the people, 
safety of the people, security of the people, of the assets um, that, uh, that we want to invest in, and uh, more and more is uh, physical security as much as cybersecurity, as we know, uh, through the digitization. So uh, those are sort of must-have, and, and it doesn't really help uh, to have a better um, a tax environment or, or, or not if those are not uh, in check. Then right after that, for us, the, 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 the first driver, again, is uh, we look at uh, the long term, we look at the market, we look at the market not only in that specific uh, country, but we look at how can we leverage uh, then our investment in that market and then leverage technology beyond that market across. Uh, we have many uh, good examples of where we introduce technology in a certain specific uh, niche that became, uh, after you know, a few years, um, a, a, global, a global technology that supported that, uh, that transformation, particularly on, on, the, on the energy side. And as I was saying before, um, we always looked at the three uh, pillars, the economic aspect, the social aspect, and the environmental aspect. But certainly, if I look at the last 10 years, the whole industry, I would say, had been focusing more and more on balancing those three. Mm. Uh, and, and there is no doubt that the uh, economic aspect, when you look at the long term, uh, is being uh, more and more uh, impacted, influenced uh, from the environmental aspect and from the social aspect. I mean, Dev, I'm interested in how if you think relative to 10 years ago. I mean, how close are we, how close are any countries that you're involved in to offering a serious long-term framework for the, in which you can embed the kind of investments you're doing into an environmental strategy? Because, you know, so much of this has been about, certainly in Europe, has been about, you know, can you provide, commit to a reliable price price of carbon? You know, and that was kind of a debate that's kind of come and gone and now come back again. Um, how far have we gone in creating that framework and how much can you be part of sort of pushing, forcing countries to make those decisions because you're making a 10, 20, 30 year investment? So I think uh, from our vantage point, uh, you know, when you look at our industry, I would say, uh, you know, in the 110 years we've been in business, probably for the first 100 years, geopolitics and technology played the dominant role in our industry. I would say the last decade, uh, there's a third dimension. Geopolitics remains very important in our industry for the obvious reasons. Technology actually is a massive enabler. Put in perspective, I've been in the company now for three decades, um, exactly three decades this month. Uh, and when I started, um, you know, what we defined as um, deep water was around sort of 300 meters. Today, what we define as deep water is 3,000, and it's got a good further and further. So technology kind of enables extraordinary uh, things in our industry and always has and always will. I think the sort of third dimension that's new is the tr transition. Uh, the, the need to make this transition uh, in, in terms of energy. And that does not actually mean that you sort of replace one with another. Because I think the idea that energy lives in a world of telephony where one day you've got fixed line phones, next day you've got mobile phones, is I don't think an accurate way of representing it. So I don't think what we see is energy divergence, we see energy coexistence. <coughs> and so different forms of energy will coexist, and then the question of course is, which forms of energy become more prevalent in the future than from compared to the past? To give the most obvious example, coal is not likely to be a growth industry. Uh, gas is, uh, when you think in the next two decades. When you think about renewables, it's gonna go faster than anything else we've seen in human history in terms of gaining market share. So this is a time of massive change. And I think um, from our vantage point, uh, what we try and do is help uh, our businesses and help our partners and therefore help ourselves in terms of making sure the transition occurs in a way that is actually generally sustainable. I mean, the fact of the matter is you know, if you only look at it from the perspective of sustainable uh, energy, I think you've missed two very important points. There's also a need for affordable energy. I mean, one and a half billion people don't have access to regular heat, light, and mobility. When you're sitting in Davos, it may not seem the most pressing problem. When you're sitting uh, somewhere in Delhi, it may be one of the most pressing problems. So the question is, how do you make the transition to sustainability in a way that actually creates also affordability? And very importantly, as you think about a world of convergence, how do you create 
firm energy or reliability because it's no good having energy that only is available when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. How do you kind of create a reliability in what I call firm energy? So I think the sort of challenge for us is how do we kind of create an integrated system rather than work in silos, which actually worked quite well for a long time. I think in a world of convergence, silos don't work that well. And therefore, I think the opportunity is to create sustainability, reliability, and affordability. I think a lot of work has been done, but undoubtedly, more work has to be done. And I think this is a very important year with COP26 in Glasgow, which I think, if it goes well, will, I think, further, I think, uh, move this dialogue forward, not just in terms of conversations, but in terms of practical action. I, if I just may, I couldn't agree more with that aspect. Uh, when, when you see at uh, the energy value chain, and particularly the aspect of, uh, you know, generating, transmitting, and distributing, and getting that energy or that electricity for that matter in the right, uh, at the right moment, the right uh, um, uh, pattern, uh, it, the complexity has increased uh, a number of folds. And therefore, uh, the previous approach of saying, you know, we technology providers, we take care about the technology, and so on, it's not enough. Uh, complexity, the speed at which the transformation, the changes from a technology standpoint uh, are, are you know, uh, developing needs that uh, collaboration. And, and I think it's a, it's a very important uh, point uh, that if we want to do the right thing uh, to the couple economic growth from uh, environmental impact and we want to do it with the right speed, uh, we have to have that uh, horizontal approach. Um, so we've got five minutes left, and then we wanted to give a chance for people here to, to ask questions, sort of brief questions. I've still got lots of things I want to ask, but I thought I'd better let you get a word in. Um, is there any anybody with a pressing question? There's a microphone here. Everyone very shy. Oh, it's one hand there, the, right at the back. If you just wait for the mic, sir, maybe just say briefly who you are. My name is Nishit Desai from Bombay, India. I'm a lawyer. Uh, we started off <coughs> with the fact that 1% of the people own 99% of the wealth. Now, in today's context, is the ownership important or excess? So even if those who have wealth, if they can create new models of doing business, for example, private property for public good, you know, you may still own it, but you allow excess. I think today it's all about excess. So what is more important or can we, how easy it is to transform 1% to 99%? Just nobody's going to give away how long it is going to take. But at least they can create some kind of new models of providing access to their wealth by, uh, you know, uh, some mechanism. That's what I'm trying to see. So, <coughs> For example, there's so much property sitting idle. Okay, Uber, uh, so Airbnb came and created access. Uber came in, you know, this, uh, the cars came into the public uh, space, right? So there could be a lot many more models. So how do we see that this 99%, and today's wealth creators are slightly different from the previous ones, and they believe in a lot more sharing, a lot more, you know, participation and stuff like that. That's what I assume, new generation of business people. So I'm thinking, can we not create some models for uh, creating access to this whole wealth? Hmm. Yeah, that will possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things, we we're you're talking about FDI, and uh, I think most people would define the kind of global FDI flows last year as being something in the order of kind of $1.3 trillion. Interesting thing is that the market that my business plays in is actually $56 trillion tied up uh, in that, and that's just looking at companies that turn over 250 a million dollars or more, so 56 trillion out of the 1.3 we're talking about, and actually, it's actually the hygiene factors I was talking about before, that free convertibility, uh, the kind of ultra low cost for transmissions, um, the together with rule of law and confidence and, and, uh, and competence of the, of the local authorities, that actually means that the enormous pools of capital that are available 
can actually be deployed. So it's actually about dealing with kind of many of these hygiene factors. The capital's there, it wants to go to work. There's better information today than was ever there before. Um, and so actually the, the FDI flows can, can be kind of exponentially greater than they've ever been before because of these, uh, these changes to the, to the hygiene factors, but more work is, is needed. Mm. And I guess that goes back to uh, some of, actually, Dev, did you want to go in? I, I think sort of the, the point is a very well made point uh, because I think digitization is fundamentally changing the way we do business. Uh, so to put in perspective, uh, when you look at our bioenergy business, BP owns a company called, 50% of a company called BP Bungay which is the world's second largest bioenergy company. Uh, we basically had uh, all our operations in very remote areas. Today, essentially what we have is a remote operating center in Sao Paulo for our business and operation, which basically monitors our assets across the country. And actually, over time, we'll start monitoring assets around the world. What does that actually mean? Well, actually, what you do create is more reliability. Today we operate our system at 98.6% reliability because you can actually then use those tools to create preventive maintenance processes. You can use those tools to optimize the value chain. So I think, you know, e even in sort of traditional industries, we are seeing new business models emerge, which I think are incredibly important and, and actually uh, are creating a new capability that I think can create a uh, massive opportunity as well. So it's not just in the new, new thing. The old, old thing actually also has to become the new, new thing, so to speak. That sounds like a suitably Davos kind of, <laughs> can mean anything to anyone kind of <laughs> phrase that we should probably uh, end on. But uh, um, I'm grateful to all the, the speakers. I mean, what uh, strikes me, I started off saying this is all old news and we could have talked about this 50 years ago, one way or another. I think what, what comes through is there is a real change. You know, it used to be that that conversation maybe 50 years ago would have been dominated about FDI as a source of finance. And then maybe 20 years after that, we would have said FDI was an, an agent of kind of best practice or good management. You know, that was what we were always taught. You wanted FDI to increase your managerial capacity and your standards. But I think now we'd, what we were just getting into is actually FDI as a, as a source of disruption, yep. um, helping to be uh, bringing, bringing positive change, and, uh, but shaking things up, creating new sectors. So thank you very much to, uh, to all our speakers, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.